Hiya! Welcome to week four. Uh, so a quick reminder of last week. So last week we started talking about orthogonal operators and in particular we looked at two dimensions where we saw that if I have an orthogonal operator, either it's going to be a rotation so I can take things and like rotate it around um, some point or I can reflect it so I can like make it flip over some um, axis or hyperplane um, kind of line or line kind of thing. Um, so now we're going to take this and we're going to take it to three dimensions and we're going to be like, okay, what does orthogonal operators look like in three dimensions? Um, and so this is what we're going to start off with today. Um, and yeah, so this is going to end up with the main result of Euler's rotation theorem. Uh, so that is kind of the goal. I don't know if we'll get to that, um, event like to, in this video, uh, but eventually we will get to the theorem, which is basically this theorem here, that if I have some orthogonal operator um, in E3, so I have an orthogonal operator in E3 that preserves the orientation. Remember that um, in two dimensions, rotations preserved the orientation, whereas reflections flipped the orientation. Um, and remember orientations, you can either be the same or opposite. Um, and we kind of just stated one to be left and one to be right orientation. So as like a little reminder, since it's been a while since we saw videos. Um, so if I look at an orthogonal operator in three dimensions that preserves the orientation, then it turns out that this is precisely identical in two dimensions. In particular, it's, that it's a rotation about an axis L by the angle phi. Um, so we won't go into, we're right now not going to say what an axis is and, and like all this in three dimensions, but this is the idea um, that we're going to try to kind of go with and uh, progress with. So we'll build up to the statement, um, but for now, uh, let's kind of uh, pretend this doesn't exist and we'll look at it a little bit later. Um, okay, so here we already have, so if you want, there'll be little notes um, uh, for rotation. So rotation, remember that we had it denoted by this P of phi um, for rotation in two dimensions. Um, so like, if we think about um, three dimensions, right? So if I want to rotate something, like I'm, I have something in three dimensions, right? How do I want to consider rotation, right? So if I think of, say you have a car, right? So if I have a car and I look at its wheel, the wheel is basically rotating, right? It's going round in a circle, or if I look at it sideways, it's going round in a circle over and over and over, right? So this we consider rotation, or what other things? Or like if you have a pinwheel, Right, so that's going to go in a circle. Or if you have a big windmill, that's going to be going around in a big circle. And this is kind of what we think of rotation, right? We don't think of like weird um, shape turny things as rotations. We really think about them as turning in some circular fashion. And usually when we're turning around some circular fashion, you'll notice that there's some point here in the middle that stays where it is, right? So in a tire, there's some rod that is staying exactly where it is. So this point in the middle is going to define a line. It's going to give us an axis that everything else rotates around. So it's all going to rotate around this point. Um, and in explicitly, what this means is a rotation is going to occur around some axis. And this is normally what we'll end up calling the axis of rotation. Um, so, okay, let's see how we define this line, right? So we have some line. How do we define it? Well, we can just take some vector. So here we'll take some arbitrary non-zero vector. Um, we'll denote it n. Uh, arbitrary non-zero vector. It has to not be zero. And we're going to look at the span of n in three dimensions. So what does this look like? Well, this is precisely, if we remember the definition, this is all the scalar multiples of n, which live inside my space, such that my, uh, my lambda is going to be uh, greater than or equal to zero. Uh, it's in um, r greater than or equal to zero. Actually, 
this is slightly wrong. I think I'm thinking of something else. So this should have r just be all r, not greater than or equal to zero. So if we recall the definition span, it's just the all positive or negative linear combinations of some vector. Okay, so we look at this line. This is going to give us a line in three dimensions. Um, and we say that ln is the axis. So this line ln is the axis directed along. Uh, here, let's highlight this. Ln is the axis directed along the vector n. So what does this kind of look like? So if I have some three dimensions, right? So we can kind of actually do this in two dimensions as well. So say I have some vector like this. Uh, that is not a very good vector. I have some vector like this. And what this line is going to do is it's going to take all linear combinations, right? So basically kind of what I have um, is I have this vector, I have this vector, I have this vector, I have this vector. So all scalar multiples. And if you kind of look at this, this is going to give me a line. And so this is what, so if n here, if this is n here, then this purple line is ln. That was a weird L, ln. Um, so notice here that ln depends only on the direction of the vector, not the magnitude. So I could have chosen any vector on this line as my starting point, but it really only matters which direction I'm going in, right? What this kind of angle is. Um, and basically what this is saying is that it doesn't matter if I multiply by some scalar mu multiple, I will always have the same thing. And so what we'll generally do is we'll always look at a normalization on n. And what a normalization is basically doing is it's saying, okay, let us um, kind of shrink this down so that the length of these vectors are precisely one. So this is done by this, by this formula here. So this is an important formula. What is this doing? It takes the vector and divides by length, divides by length, or I guess here I'm just writing length, length, right? So in other words, if my vector is too long, like it's uh, like the number two long, then I want to divide by two so that it's only a unit length, it's one length. Um, and so this is basically the idea for normalizing vectors. We want to keep them all one unit length, um, because as we saw, at least in particular for like orthonormal bases, this is a very nice thing. Um, okay, so how do we define a rotation? So here we're going to need three things, right? I needed um, an axis of rotation and I want an angle, right? This is kind of the things we saw here, a rotation about an axis L by an angle phi. So I need a rotation, uh, an axis, and I need an angle. Um, so let us do this. So here we're going to take a linear operator and we're going to look at um, a basis B that has three vectors. And notice here, notice that my basis here has a particular note and that here, this is a normalized, this is normalized, right? This is what we just defined here and hat. Uh, so we have three vectors. Um, and we're going to say this is a orthonormal basis. So in particular, we know that f and g are also unit vectors. Um, now we look at p and we say it's a rotation about an axis ln by the angle by the angle phi if it acts on the basis in the following way. So we want to do something with the basis. So remember how this axis on a tire it's keeping this point, this axis exactly the same. Like the, the, um, the, this point stays where it is. So we really want that the linear operator doesn't do anything with the, this axis. It should stay the same. It should stay identical. What does it do with the other ones? Well, we want it to use just a standard note rotation, right? So this we can kind of think of in two dimensions, right? So if I fix this kind of line, I can think of, just looking at everything perpendicular to this, you can see this kind of makes a two dimensional rotation, oops, a two dimensional rotation. And so we're just going to look at this in a two dimensional fashion. And this we saw last time is just given by f times cosine of phi plus g sine of phi um, minus f sine of phi plus f 
plus g cosine of phi. Now this might not look familiar, but once but let's look at the matrix represent, representation. So what's the matrix representation? N is giving me one zero zero. F is giving me zero. Then I have cosine of phi, sine of phi. And then the last one gives me zero minus sine of phi and cosine of phi. Now this, uh, this matrix here on the bottom right should look familiar. This sub matrix here, this should look um, very familiar. Uh, and yeah, so we're going to stop here now that we have a definition. Um, and we'll look at this theorem um, in a little more generality or like in a little more detail next time. Or should I just finish it? Uh, actually, yeah, I'll just finish. Sorry, this is going to be slightly longer for a video because um, I think we're, we're near-ish to the end. Uh, no, no, actually, I'd rather have shorter. I'll see you in the next video um, where we'll, we'll kind of keep this going. Uh, so I'll see you then. Um, and in the next video, we'll break down this definition and kind of see what's happening geometrically. So um, it will be good to slow it down. Uh, so I will see you then. Peace.